three, which is known to some folks as Real ID. Um, what makes a license compliant is essentially two things, allowing the Department of Safety to retain your photograph that's taken and social security number. Not to print the number on a license, but merely for the department to retain. Um, right now, those two items are optional uh, for a citizen. They can choose whether or not to allow the department to uh, retain that information. Um, going forward, this would still allow individuals to make that choice. Uh, this would not require anyone to provide that information for retention purposes for the department. Um, also, what the legislation doesn't do is to make this information part of any national database um, or affix any kind of device or anything to a driver's license. It merely would have a mark um, that says compliant or non-compliant. The reason for sponsoring the legislation at the behest of the department is really um, the citizen impact if we were to not do this at this time. Um, access to airports through TSA would be limited if our New Hampshire driver's licenses are not compliant. Currently today, uh, there's limited access to the Seabrook nuclear power plant or any other nuclear facility in the country and many of our federal buildings. Um, if one of our U.S. Senators were to try to use their license today, um, their access could potentially be limited. And although it's true that there are a number of other forms of identification, we know few people, fewer people possess those and possess either driver's license or identification cards. So this bill is really, as I said, um, at the behest of the department, but really for the convenience of our citizens. So citizens that want to travel, want to access federal facilities, will be able to do so if their license is compliant. Those that choose not to provide this information will not be forced to do anything. They just may have difficulties in obtaining access going forward. Um, I would note there was one error made in drafting, and that was with respect to the effective date, which you'll see on page 2, line 12, says 60 days. Uh, it will take the department, I believe, a little more time than that, so I would recommend um, if the committee passes the bill to change that date to January 1st of 2016. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. Questions are coming. So did I understand you to say that if we don't do this, then our driver's license as they stand today may not be accepted by TSA? That is my understanding, Senator. Yes. And that, and that well, that information comes from who? Uh, that information was provided to me from the department, from federal law. Uh, uh, why, why is the bill not written? Well, let me say, the bill is currently written that we're going to do this unless you say don't. Why is it not reversed that they're going to get the card unless people approve? that information on it. Um, you mean the language starting on line seven? Yeah, it, Senator, it says a, that you shall. Out. Okay. It's an opt-out right now as opposed to an opt-in. Um, I think for the convenience of our citizenry, it made more sense to draft it that way. Um, if there are issues with respect to compliance at the federal level, perhaps the department could address your, your question when they testify. Um, but my understanding is this really was for convenience of our citizenry. Um, right now you have a choice when you go for your license renewal as to whether or not you want that information retained by the department. And um, this would, as I said, still allow for that choice to be made by the individual. This doesn't in any way uh, require any individual to do something that they don't choose to. Other questions at the Seeing them, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Kevin Bloom, um, Liberty Alliance, the Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Kevin Bloom, and I'm here representing the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. I had, frankly, I was 
hoping that the NHCLU would speak first so I could hear what they had to say. I don't want to duplicate that and I'll be very brief. We look at New Hampshire uh, as a state that's preserved a number of our freedoms that are lost elsewhere. And most of the members of this committee probably remember a time when you didn't need a driver's license to get on a plane. I don't think there's any sense that we're freer today than we were then. And although it looks, we're certainly thankful that there is uh, an opt-out provision. We do think it would be nicer if it was an opt-in provision, although there already is one. You can obtain a United States passport if you want to be in. We look at it as a slippery slope. Now perhaps there will be an option to have your information supplied, and how long will it be until that's no longer an option. So therefore, we oppose this bill and ask you to vote IT on it. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, just to follow up on what you were saying, if we redrafted this to say that it was an, an opt-in so that your license and not having to get a passport, you get a license issue that would be compliant to the federal statute. So no matter what they eventually did about enforcing or not enforcing it, this in TSA and so on, would you support that? We would have to look at the bill, and, but like I was saying, I think that what we're looking at is that if you want to opt in, you can actually um, get a passport and standing, uh, keeping New Hampshire off of that standard would be the preferable first first place in terms of preference and then second, an opt-in certainly sounds uh, better than you have to opt out of it. Thank I you. hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Bill Allen, opposed uh, but not speaking. We have Jim Harper. Doesn't indicate whether he's opposed or not, but he wants to speak. <laughs> hi. hi, Jim Harper with the Cato Institute. Uh, Cato is a nonprofit uh, uh, organization that doesn't take positions, yay or nay, on legislation. But I certainly want to make you aware of the, the Real ID Act and uh, some of its consequences <coughs> for the people, for liberty, for your budgets, and so on and so forth. I will try to be brief, of course, though I think I have a lot of material to share with you. And I have a written, written um, testimony that I'd be happy to make available uh, and, and put in the record if that's acceptable. Uh, first of all, in, in brief, uh, the Real ID Act is, is a U.S. national ID law that was passed in, in uh, May of 2005. Yep. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> um, it was passed attached to a military spending bill and didn't get uh, separate consideration in the Senate. It was a must-pass uh, bill that, uh, that if, you, if you tried to amend it, you were going to be charged with not supporting the troops. So I don't think it got a fair hearing in the Congress when it was passed. It was sold as a key recommendation of the 911 Commission. Uh, but that's um, rather an exaggeration. There was a three quarters of a page of a 400 page report that talked about identity, identity issues. And the Real ID, actually, Real ID Act actually uh, uh, withdrew legis legislation that had passed before that, uh, that, that created a negotiated rulemaking where departments of motor vehicles, privacy advocates, and many others would get, get together and figure out what to do. About, about driver licensing. So Real ID came in and plopped down the national ID system on top of a, a process that was going on already. It created a three-year implementation deadline, uh, but the, the Department of Homeland Security took two years to, to produce the regulations, and so immediately started falling back on the deadline, saying, that in, in my testimony, I've detailed a, a sort of long series of, of cases where the, the DHS hasn't enforced this and the TSA hasn't enforced this. And I'm basically here to tell you that they won't enforce it in the future, um, given states like New Hampshire standing up uh, to, to the TSA and the DHS, as they've done in the past. Um, the reason is fairly simple. It's <coughs> the fact that should push come to shove, it's going to be TSA agents that are standing there at America's airports telling American citizens, law-abiding people, you can't travel. Mr. Harper, can yes, I ask please. you to speak to the piece of legislation that we have in front of of course, um, the, the legislation. We appreciate your testimony. We have given us, and we can read that. I understand. But in okay. the essence of time, we can direct your questions to the piece of legislation that we have. The legislation is 
is a small but I think important step toward Real ID compliance in New Hampshire. Uh, it's a step, and I understand the, the desire of the Department of Public Safety and the sponsor to come up with some kind of compromise that works for the state. But by committing the state to any part of Real ID compliance, you're moving down the road to handing off responsibility for driver licensing decisions to the federal government. Um, if you are real ID compliant and the federal government changes its standards for, for driver's licenses, you have to do what, what the federal government says uh, from then on. So my strong recommendation to you is that uh, you not move toward compliance even in this way, whether it be, you know, opt, opt out is, uh, rather opt in is better than opt out, but any move toward real ID compliance is a move toward transferring your authority from here in the New Hampshire State House to Washington, D.C., where they will decide what, what your licenses have to look like from now on. When, when the regulation was initially issued, uh, the, the, obli the obligatory economic analysis that came with it predicted costs of $17 billion nationwide, about $50 per man, woman, child. Now, delays and paring back on the requirements to what they call now a material compliance checklist uh, has reduced the cost so far, but those are the kind of costs that over time will be imposed on states by the DHS if states agree to hand off their authority. So for that reason, this bill being a small, modest step is still a step in the wrong direction uh, in terms of Americans' privacy and control over your state, your state licensing and your state budgets. Questions of the committee? Uh, I, I guess I do have one. Um, if we reversed it to uh, an opt uh, in instead of an opt out, that would still leave the individuals the right to choose, right? It would. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. I have uh, Representative Bart Formal uh, opposed but not speaking. Uh, Devin? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, other members of the committee. Um, I am Devin Chafee, for the record. Uh, my name is Devin Chafee, and I'm the Executive Director of the ACLU uh, here in New Hampshire. Uh, we're an organization uh, that has uh, over 3,000 members statewide, and we've been defending and advancing civil liberties in the state of New Hampshire for over 40 years. Uh, and I am here to urge the committee to recommend uh, that the Senate deem SB uh, uh, 262 FN uh, inexpedient to legislate. The New Hampshire legislature took quite a stance in 2007 when it passed a law that would prohibit New Hampshire from participating in a national identification system. Um, and I'm here to urge this committee to stick fast to that stance that the legislature took along with the governor uh, you know, in 2007 that it should not back down from its refusal to participate in a system that could potentially jeopardize the privacy rights of New Hampshire citizens. Uh, in 2007, the law prohibiting New Hampshire compliance with the real ID um, was adopted with unanimous support in the Senate. So it was completely bipartisan. There wasn't a single senator that voted against it. And it passed in the House in a vote of 268 to 8. So overwhelming support in the House, including then Representative, Honorable Representative Daniel Sewell in the House at that time. Um, and it was also enthusiastically signed into law uh, by then Governor uh, John Lynch. And I just want to uh, read a, a quick quote from, uh, rep um, from Governor Lynch at that time. He stated that New Hampshire and many other states across the nation have raised legitimate questions about privacy protection and the cost of real ID. To date, the federal government has ignored these real problems and has barreled ahead with real ID. We have a law that prohibits New Hampshire from taking part in this burdensome system and New Hampshire has a right to reject it. So the reason why New Hampshire's legislature and the governor supported prohibiting New Hampshire from participating in this program was because of <coughs> concerns that it would create, that creation of this national ID system would jeopardize uh, privacy of citizens by allowing the federal government to more easily track uh, the uh, conduct um, and actions of citizens, and also concerns about the burden and costs that it would put uh, on New Hampshire taxpayers. Could I ask you to speak Certainly. So what this bill would do, essentially, is it would allow, it would repeal 
the, the bill that was passed in 2007, the statute that was passed that prohibited New Hampshire's participation, and then it would bring um, the um, uh, New Hampshire, it would, it would bring and require New Hampshire to bring its IDs up to, uh, to real ID standards, the standards required by the federal government, um, with an exception for you know, uh, if a particular citizen wanted to opt out, that particular citizen could opt out, then they would get a license plate, they would essentially have a license plate that would be branded as not federally acceptable, it would be a different color. Um, but the, you know, but assuming for those individuals that didn't opt out, then they would have a, a real ID compliant identification. So essentially this bill entirely reverses the stance that the New Hampshire legislature took in 2007 when it prohibited participation in this program. And what was happening, I want to put it into a national context, because when New Hampshire in 2007 took this stance, it took that stance along in several other states, and currently there are 13 other states that took the same position, that they were not going to let the federal government dictate to them how they were going to issue their licenses. Um, and so currently, uh, in addition to New Hampshire, 13 other states have adopted laws prohibiting them complying um, from, with Real ID. So New Hampshire was part of this movement that said to the Department of Homeland Security, that said to the federal government, we are not going to allow you to impose these types of regulations on us um, uh, and we're going we're to take a stand. And by doing so, because there were so many states that come out, came out and said we're not going, going to allow this burden on us, that's a huge part of the reason why the Department of Homeland Security hasn't been able to implement Real ID. They haven't been able to demand compliance. Right now, if they were to demand, if TSA was to demand that all non-compliant IDs are not accepted at airports, it would be rejecting about 20% of the U.S. population because so many states have, have, not just are they not in compliance, but they have laws on their books prohibiting them from complying with Real ID. And this is why DHS has postponed and postponed and postponed again and again uh, implementation. It's part because states like New Hampshire took a stance um, and largely prevailed. So in 2000, uh, the original Real ID statute said that Real ID... Again, I'm just going to bring it back to the piece of legislation. Right, this is all because it, what this legislation would do is it would make New Hampshire Real ID compliant. Um, it would be taking another state out of what has become really a, um, a, a movement of states across the country that has been a, a huge obstacle to DHS being able to implement a national ID system that would jeopardize the, uh, the privacy rights not only of New Hampshire citizens but of citizens throughout the country. Because states like New Hampshire have stood up, DHS hasn't been able to implement it. And, and the original Real ID statute, federal law, stated that, in, um, that Real ID was supposed to be implemented by 2008. And they had to delay it in 2008. They weren't able to do it. They delayed again in 2009. They delayed again in 2011. So when the DHS says that by 2016, you're going to require, it's really, this time really for sure, they're going to require um, Real ID compliant uh, IDs at the airport, there is a huge reason to, sus to suspect that that is not going to happen. Because TSA politically and practically is not going to be denying 20% of the U.S. population access to airports across the country. Just so politically. You wouldn't even consider opting in. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing you say? I would, I would not. I, obviously, opt, an opt-in provision is preferable to an opt-out provision. But what I would say is that even by having an opt-in provision, you are eroding what has been this strong movement against the idea of a national um, ID. So you're taking, again, you're taking New Hampshire out of this strong group of states that have stood up and said we're not going to allow a national ID in this country. Um, and so I would strongly urge the committee to simply stay true to the original legislation that was passed in 2007 that said we're not going to participate. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have secure IDs. New Hampshire does have secure IDs in, in, many, way, uh, in many ways. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a fairly adv advanced identification if you compare it to other states. Um, but what we're not going to do is participate, is let the federal government tell us what kind of information we're going to collect, how long we're going to keep it, and what other states we're going to share that information with. 
um, and we're not going to allow the federal government to impose that kind of cost on the state as well. Uh, and for those reasons, I would respectfully urge the committee to recommend that the Senate deem SB uh, 262 inexpedient to legislate. Question to the committee. Seeing none. Senator Sorry, Chair. Uh, and I apologize, Senator Susie, and the committee. I was at in a different bill at the time. I didn't hear Senator Susie's testimony to Devin. I'm looking at the governor's letter here. Uh, first sentence of second paragraph, without this legislation, New Hampshire residents would be required to obtain a federal passport in order to enter secure facilities or to travel. Um, and you, you hit around this, but what, what is the state of the requirement right now? What, uh, in, terms of the fe in terms of that concern, entering secure facilities and, and, and travel? Certainly, um, Senator. It's a very good question. Um, so right now, the, the, the phase of uh, compliance that we're currently in, um, there is some, there, you know, DHS has stated that there is, they, that you need for some access to some federal buildings, you need access. Um, you need a, a, a real ID, compliant ID. There are exceptions to that, including, you know, you can access a courthouse for legal reasons using a non-compliant ID. There are a number of exceptions to that requirement. Um, we have not, I have not been made aware of, you know, any individual in New Hampshire that has been denied access to a federal building. What we have seen is that whatever implementation is happening is happening in a very spotty manner. So, you know, they, they, you know one day one person may be denied access to a particular facility, um, but we're not seeing any consistent implementation of that or we're not aware of it. You know, it'll be interesting to see from the Department of Safety um, comments whether or not they, they're aware of a, of a widespread issue with regards to not, New Hampshire citizens not having access to buildings. Um, what this, the, um, the real, I think, uh, threat that, D, that the Department of Homeland Security is making is access to airports. Is the TSA, can you get on a plane with a non-compliant non ID? And what they've done is they've repeatedly delay implementation of that requirement. Um, until now, the, the deadline is now set in, in 2016. And as I said before, I think that there, you know, I think it's very, very likely that the Department of Homeland Security will have to again extend that deadline because if they were only to accept real ID compliant IDs at the airports, then they would be jeopardizing the right of, you know, thousands of U.S. citizens from being able to travel. Um, and it just practically, and um, and politically, for you know, T TSA is not the most popular agency um, in in uh, in the federal government, certainly not in the country. Uh, for them to to begin turning away, the, you know, as I said, what is approximately 20 percent of the U.S. population, I think, is just practically and politically very unlikely. Yeah. But it, but it's no. you know, you sorry, Chair. Sorry. Are you finished? Yes. Any other questions of the committee? Uh, yeah, I ask, I'm sorry I had to step out for a moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think as, uh, I've asked the earlier witnesses if this were flipped to be an opt-in, would you support that? Um, Senator Waters, I, I wouldn't support an, an opt-in. I, I, I would say that, it, of course, it would be preferable. Um, it would be preferable to an opt-out. Um, but as I stated earlier, I think that even having an opt-in provision, what it does is it takes it, it erodes what, what, what was a, a strong and has been a strong movement of states to, to stand up and say, we're not going to participate in a national ID. And we're not going to allow the federal government to make us participate in a national ID system. We just don't, we think that's, that really jeopardizes, it puts, it puts um, onerous burdens on the state and it also jeopardizes the privacy rights of our citizens. Um, and that, and it is that strong movement that has made it so that the Department of Homeland Security hasn't been able to implement real ID. Like that movement worked. <laughs> Department of Homeland Security wasn't able to successfully uh, uh, require real ID in places like the airport because states like New Hampshire said no. And my concern is that even by allowing an opt-in provision, you're really eroding what that, that barrier that has, has prevented DHS from successful implementation of a national ID system. And that either an opt-in or an opt-out provision really begins to to open the door uh, for 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 essentially you know, for the United States to, to have a national ID system in place. Now the Department of, uh, of Security may, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, the Department of um, Safety 
may, uh, may not agree with my characterization of the real ID as a national ID program, but you know, we, we feel very strongly that it is. Uh, it creates standardized uh, requirements for what's on your ID, for what information you have to get when somebody looks, gets an ID, for what information you have to keep. Um, uh, with regards to that individual um, and with regards to sharing that information with other states. And in our opinion, uh, that is a national ID system that essentially the federal government is, is implementing through the states and, and requiring the states to implement by this threat that someday you're not going to be able to get on an airplane. Um, and I think, it, I think it's laudable that New Hampshire and New Hampshire's elected officials stood up and said, no, we're not, we're, not, we're not going to cave to that pressure, and that they should continue to stand up for that principle. Thank you. Further questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. What I have is uh, Rick Barrett, Jamie, and the department. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Welcome. My name is Rick Bailey, Director of the Division of Motor Vehicles. Um, we sought uh, support from Senator Susi to introduce this bill um, because we thought it was something that needed to be looked at again. Um, as you've heard, uh, original position of the state was taken in 2007. It's now 2015, and a number of things have changed since then. Um, certainly the original dates that the federal government put forward for implementation were not achieved um, and have been delayed and in various cases continue to be delayed. However, over the past two years, we've started to see enforcement come into place. And so we thought it was important that the legislature take a look at this. Um, we perceive this as a service to the citizens to allow them to choose to have a compliant ID so that they can get on airplanes. As everyone has talked about, there are a number of restrictions and the document that I just handed out walks through the different, um, at the top, the different security facilities and, and when they are becoming uh, full enforcement for real ID compliant IDs. Um, for the average citizen, that probably doesn't have an impact unless you're trying to take a tour of Seabrook uh, or go to some of the federal buildings, uh, the non-public areas of them. Where, in fact, it does come into play is when TSA starts to enforce this at airports. Um, right now, there is not a specific date other than not sooner than 2016. Um, however, if we were to choose to bring our IDs into compliance, we need time to do that. In New Hampshire, we have a five-year cycle. So if we start to do anything with a driver's license, it'll take us five years to complete whatever that change is. Um, and so we have seen uh, in the handout, you'll see there are eight states, including New Hampshire, eight states or territories, that are currently deemed to be in full non-compliance. Um, most of those have um, laws that prevent them from participating. There are 22 states that are in compliance, and then the middle group, if you will, are the 24 states that have DHS extensions. They have taken some steps to show Homeland Security that they are headed toward compliance. Um, every state is a little bit different, um, but again, our concern is um, there are only eight states left that are fully non-compliant and non-participating. Um, and at some point, we're concerned that the um, prohibition to get on airplanes will actually come into place and then New Hampshire citizens will feel the impact. Um, I guess with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Questions, okay. General Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps I wasn't listening carefully enough, but let me ask this question. Um, let's say that suddenly there was enforcement. Um, how long would it take the department to gear up and get IDs ready that people could get? Well, for um, it depends on how we interpret enforcement. The uh, states that have deemed to be compliant means two things. Their cards that they're issuing are compliant and their program is compliant. They are allowed uh, basically a cycle, in our case five years, to bring all the individual IDs into compliance. Now that's what's happened over the past number of years. If, if we were to pass this bill and shoot for beginning a program in um, January of 2016, we would hope that the federal government would allow us till 2021 to make all the issued cards have to be in compliance. But at this point, there's no guarantee of that. Um, I mean, Paul, I, I was really trying to reverse the question, that if, let's say in January in 2016 at some point, 
it really began to be enforced, would we, at that point, be able to make a change in law that would give us the five years, or would we just be stuck? Um, until we passed the law and sought the, the waiver from the feds, we would kind of be stuck. It would all be about timing. Um, and I, I don't know whether they would say, no, you're the last state, so boom, it has to be all today, um, or whether we would be allowed the, the time that other states have had. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Um, notification of the uh, implementation dates. Uh, how much advance notice do you have there? Um, well, as you can see, most of the time it's been um, uh, over a year. I mean, the fact that it's coming has been in law for quite a while. What we're talking about is the, yes, we're serious, now we're going to implement this law. And it, it's usually been um, a year to 18 months. Um, we don't know their announcement of no sooner than 2016. I don't know how, how much they consider that notice uh, for TSA to start requiring the real ID compliant IDs. And um, if it would take um, a year to process it through the legislature, which I think we could fast track anything we needed to fast track, um, if it actually came down that it was implemented within a certain period of time, could you, how quickly could you uh, get everyone in compliance? How quickly could you do it? I'm not saying that, right. you know, I just got my there's, license and it's five years. Could you contact two, me and tell me I needed to get into there it? Are, there are two pieces to that. We have to bring our program into compliance, meaning the documents that we ask for when you come in to prove who you are and you should get a real ID um, requirement. And then we have to do that for the citizens that want compliant documents. So we could change our process to require the additional documentation and track the documentation probably in, in 60 days or so. But then it becomes a question of how fast could we see the people that want it you would have to pick the percentage. We have a little over a million licensed drivers and roll in non-driver IDs. It's about 1.1 million. Um, about 250,000 driver's licenses or ID cards are renewed or issued each year. So in the first year, 250,000 people would come in and have the option. But if we aren't grandfathered, how many of the other three quarters of a million people would want to come in in the first year to get their compliant ID and what would that do to the lines and the resources that we have at DMV. So I, I can't give you a, a time or how long it would take us to get every citizen that wants one to have a real ID compliant document issued if we don't have any sort of a grandfathering. I just know that we couldn't stand the doubling of our business without a severe impact on the turnaround time and the wait times that people experience at DMV. The questions of me, seeing them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't have anyone else signed in to um, speak, so yes. Will I be permitted to speak? I didn't yeah. get a chance to sign up. Here. You are. My name is Tim O'Flaherty. Tim O'Flaherty. Tim O'Flaherty. My name is Tim O'Flaherty. I'm from Manchester. Um, I wanted to, to speak in opposition to the bill uh, first. I'd like to voice my opinion that any concern that the department may have about a rush to implement this is overblown in my opinion. Um, the federal government has delayed and postponed for years and years. And uh, as uh, the ACLU mentioned, there's sporadic enforcement at the best. Um, there's not going to be a mad uh, rush to the DMV to comply with the uh, real ID. Um, the feds will, if that situation uh, came about, allow enough time. That's, it's, it's a bluff uh, that there's a danger. Um, I'd like to speak to the, the point about opting in. Um, I pose an opt-in scenario, um, mainly because the citizens of New Hampshire, through their elected representatives, have already explicitly and adamantly opted out. Um, I would like to just remind the committee of uh, the prohibition that this bill would repeal. 
which uh, states that the Real ID Act of 2005 is contrary and repugnant to Articles 1 through 10 of the New Hampshire Constitution, as well as Amendments 4 through 10 of the Constitution of the United States of America. Therefore, the student in New Hampshire shall not participate in any driver's license program pursuant to the Real ID Act of 2005 or in any national identification card system that may follow therefrom. This is a national ID card. That's what it is. Don't be fooled by the opt-in. This is national ID. New Hampshire has already opted out. Uh, as uh, Devin Chief mentioned, only make eight members of the legislature um, had a dissenting opinion. It passed the Senate, the governor, New Hampshire has explicitly opted out. We don't need to repeal this. There's no need, there's no danger of the feds enforcing this uh, anytime soon. There's no need for it. Um, speaking of the uh, permission or the, uh, the intent uh, that the legislature has expressed, uh, I just have a, a side uh, thought. Last year, New Hampshire passed a law prohibiting the use of facial recognition technology. Now, I believe that one of the features of the uh, Real ID, as far as from the federal perspective, is to use facial uh, recognition technology in the digital photograph that is required in the ID. Um, now, New Hampshire's law wouldn't uh, have anything conflicting with the federal use of facial recognition. But it's a clear statement uh, from the New Hampshire legislature that says, we do not agree with the use of facial recognition technology. So that is another consideration. Um, and like I said, I uh, just want to say we. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. If there's no one else to speak, I will close the hearing on uh, 262 and take a three minute break. Uh, and then we will take. Thank you. I'll go check on my other hearing. Okay, that's what I'm going to do.